This is going to be the stage that uh, so many people have said will be the, uh, the platform for the big stage tomorrow when they go through the uh, Pyrenees into Pamplona of the day. Today and tomorrow when Miguel Indrain has got to stamp his authority on the race if he's going to have any chance of keeping the yellow jersey through into the, uh, uh, the final day on Sunday in Paris. So if you're watching it today live on Eurosport on the Tuesday, good afternoon to you from myself, uh, David Duffield, and I look forward to your company not only today but also tomorrow when we've got eight hours in the saddle should I say in the commentator's chair big day tomorrow but a big day today because this could be the one that sets the scene for tomorrow's activity and as ever uh, young Rooks here has prepared to go away at the front he wanted to get the stage yesterday uh, so much because we went into uh, Villeneuve so lot and uh, it went right past uh, his home territory. TVM launched one rider down the road. If you saw the programme, Van Pedigam was away, and uh, they actually got their numbers all mixed up in some respects because they were trying to get Rooks down the road. But nevertheless, Van Pedigam was the one that uh, stayed with that group of some uh, six men, and that ruined the whole setup as far as Young Rooks was concerned. But I suppose he decided that. Uh, on the next day, if you can't win one, you might as well come back and have a go on another day. We've had a breakaway group of uh, three men trying to survive the pressure from the rest of the field. And that's probably the way it's going to be that the main field don't mind one or two of the lesser lights going way off the front because the course today from uh, Argent to Lud Autocom on stage 16 of the tour, covering 199 kilometres in all, then um, it's really all at the back end of the race that the action could well happen, because we got the climb of Lord Autocom, and that one is something to be uh, seen. Believe you me, it's a Hope Category climb, as they call it, 13.5 kilometres, and 8% is the climb. So they've got a tough old finish, this one. Only a modest uh, fourth category climb at... Uh, we are struck after some 134 kilometers of racing. I can't see that they're going as they got riding over this one now. That uh, with the escapers just down the road, anybody's unduly bothered with some 64 kilometers uh, left to go before the the proverbial hits the fan. I suppose you could say because it's going to be one of those one of those days. I think at the very end of it, I'm not surprised that many of the riders here perhaps are apprehensive. Well, the damage that could be done on the top men watching each other like hawks like they have been doing ever since we had the uh, the rest day at gap Back up with uh, Rooks in the front here. So 62 kilometres left to, to the finish now of this stage at uh, Lord Odecombe. By the way, today uh, is Indrain's birthday, as we're watching young Rooks here settling down at the front, and I wonder if he's going to try and get himself a birthday present by closing that gap on the overall classification. Let me put you in the picture on the uh, GC as it is, as we've gone into today. If you haven't caught up with it in your, in your newspapers, the gap between uh, Bjorn Rees, who's leading overall, as we're now at 138 kilometres of racing covered at uh, Saloil, Now just 60 kilometres left uh, with Rooks out on his own. The overall classification then shows that Olano is at 56 seconds in second spot. De Berzin is third at one minute and eight seconds. You've probably got those in your national newspaper. They usually give the top three or maybe top six. Uh, if, if you read it then, you'll find in fourth spot coming into today, 
Uh, Rominger at 1 minute and 21 seconds. Uh, Jan Ulrich at 2 minutes and 6 seconds. Uh, Luttenberger, the Austrian little mountain climber, the specialist there, 2 minutes 38 seconds down. Baronk in 7th spot, 3 minutes 16 seconds on general classification. Miguel in rain, 4 minutes and 38 seconds uh, in 8th uh, spot. And Dufo is in 9th uh, spot at 5 minutes and 3 seconds. Askartin of Kelmy, 5 minutes 17 seconds in 10th in spot. Hovering there, Ugramov, 11th overall, 5.55 down. And Leblanc, who's been going very well in the mountains so far, he won here when we last came to uh, Lourdes to come in 1994. Leblanc at 6 minutes and 47 seconds down on the general classification of uh, Bjorn Rees in the yellow jersey. Off the pace since his two crashes, uh, Zilla is bay back in 17th spot, 11 minutes 45 down. And um, for British uh, supporters of Chris Borman, he's lying 31st overall at the moment at 33 minutes and 20 seconds. Well, the hopeful attempts by the three riders we've had going away early on look like they're going to be absorbed, I think, once the hammer goes down. And my well, take on FaceTime too. I did say that uh, when we had the stage here last year, when uh, Veronk won it, if you heard that programme, my apologies, of course. In fact, Veronk did win the stage that came through Lords uh, last year. We came through on a very similar course, but we, we turned a slightly different direction and we didn't go up to Otacom last year. The uh, race uh, doing almost the same we're doing this time, but it, it turned away up to the, was it right or left, I forget now, and in fact on the climb then we actually finished uh, that day with uh, Baronk taking the stage. I'm just looking back here to see what's happened to the yellow jersey and the rest of them. And it was, of course, uh, into Cotre last year. Can't see where the other jerseys got to the moment. Anyway, yes. So going back to what happened last year, it was stage 15 from uh, Saint-Giron to Cotre when we had that terrible accident with Fabio Castatelli and Richard Bronk won the one. So although I said he actually finished at Hodecam, that was uh, LeBlanc the year before that finished at Hodecam. So sorry, egg on face there, but it's just down the road from the finish today or just over the other side of the mountain where they had the finish last year. So on familiar territory to a large extent, and certainly somebody like LeBlanc would like to get himself another victory. Well, Rooks is still hammering away here, and uh, as we're inside, 60 kilometres to go. It's very flat indeed. There's just nothing really to break the, uh, the course up. Uh, they're heading almost uh, due south from the start this morning at uh, Argeon, and he's determined to show himself in front of his family and friends, this rider from uh, TVM. And uh, he's always been a spirited competitor, but somehow I don't think he'll stay out there all the way to the finish. On this stage of the Tour de France uh, to Lourdes Haut de Come, they're now on the climb, the final 13.5 kilometres of the stage that could well uh, not only decide the race, it certainly is going to set the scene for the stage through the Pyrenees tomorrow, and Indrain has got to ride himself up closer to the yellow jersey today, but Reese has been looking so strong. You see the yellow jersey now on the right-hand side of the pack, just where that pink jersey overtakes him, And Ulrich on the left-hand side is screaming with a big T on the back of his jersey. An attack then coming off the front. It looks like Zula might be going for his stage victory here. Zula, who had the uh, yellow jersey after the prologue time trial, he crashed twice. We had that eventful day when we had four hours of coverage of the stage into uh, what was it, Les Arcs, wasn't it, where the whole thing got turned upside down on its ears. And Zula, having crashed twice on that stage the same day that... Uh, Brunel crashed. Great picture in the sighting this week, or last week, of that uh, crash of Brunel coming up out of the ravine, and also of uh, this man now who's got to look for a stage victory for Anse with Jalabert out of the race following his uh, stomach trouble. And he's now pulling in Rooks. Well, this young lad has tried so hard to uh, stay away from the pack, but now his time's over, and in fact, he'd probably find himself going straight out the back of the pack. He looks very tired indeed. Laurent Rooks uh, from Ka'or has now been taken over, uh, overtaken by Zula. Ulrich on the front, Fernando Jeans in the 
national colours of Spain, the Spanish champion, with Veronica alongside him. And then number one there, Big Mig himself, Big Linderain, on his birthday today, with, with just behind him on that white jersey with a reddish splash across it, that's the career ride at Luxembourger. Uh, Dufo is there as well, and on the yellow colours on the right hand side, that's uh, Luc Leblanc. Uh, on the far side there in the green, Escatin. Can't see any sign of an attack then from Olano. Sitting further back in the pack. You can just see him in the middle of that the group now, Olano. And where is Berzin? And where are Rominger? Not now screen at the moment. Bjorn Reese just on the right hand side. There putting his hat on. That's uh, Ugramov. This is working in the yes, I've just seen Berzin there as well. As the camera goes back a little bit. So Ulrich on the front, then Veronk, then Fernandez Jean, then in the yellow colours is LeBlanc, then Dufour, on the top of the screen is uh, Indrain, and then Brochard starts to go. Brochard starts to go, and he's been marked out by one of the telecom riders. Nine seconds back to Zilla. Oh, the split has happened. The tail end Charlies now are resigned to grovelling their way up here, leaving the top men in the tour to bat it out as uh, Rochard goes on the front. <laughs> Ulrich climbing very well indeed. On the right-hand side, Indrain is up the front. He's not just going to sit too far the back, he's just watching here at the front. Indrain on the right-hand side. Then in the yellow, just behind him, Leblanc who's probably expecting, I think, something to come from Indurain, so he's hovering on the great man's back wheel, and you can see further in the middle of the pack, the yellow jersey of Rees watching everything up just in front of him. Zuller is down the road, no threat over on general classification, Zuller at the moment, lying 17th, 11 minutes, 45 seconds down. Now let him go away. Oh, a lot of the Benesta rides have been lashed. According to the uh, information coming over at the headphones now that none of the top men have been lashed at the moment, although Bonesto have been thinned right down. And this is the man who's got to do it all on his own. There, a Bursley number 51 in the midst of that group. Back shot of really everybody who's in contention. The top uh, dozen men or so in the, in the general classification all together. Right in the centre of the picture, the little white jersey, that's uh, Luttenberger. Indrain on the front. Pink shirt of, or pink shoulders on the shirt of Ulrich. And they're going to reel in Zilla any moment now. Might well have gone too soon. Perhaps he thought that the big boys were watching each other. It might be a chance for him to get a couple of minutes lead on the lower part of the slopes to the top of the climb today, 1,560 metres above sea level, 10 kilometres to go, and Zula has been reeled in. Indrain on the front, then the polka dot jersey for Ronk. Ulrich next lying third. Uh, Zula's blown. Zula's played his cards and failed, at least a determined effort by the man who had hoped to get a podium place in Paris or a stage victory is now suffering. In range, still there. Ulrich, Leblanc, Veron, Escartin, Reese, Ugramov, Dufo. Oh, Rominger's beginning to struggle. Rominger, that knee trouble, you can see his knee strapped up, he's, he's grimacing here. Tony Rominger is in really all sorts of trouble now. Well, Amberger is still in there, Askarten is still there, and one man who's not there now, who's unfortunately finding it a bit tough, and that is... Uh, Rominger that's been shelled out, so that'll give Olano much more freedom now. Ulrich still leading the pace up here. He's got to hold that pace nice and constant for Reese back there in the yellow jersey. One, two, three, four, fifth in the front. 
just what about uh, 16 men here and Rominger struggling, struggling, struggling to stay here. He's lying fourth there on General Classic game. Looks like he's going to be shut out. <laughs> the speed has shut up under the impetus of uh, Dufo. So Festina are trying hard here to, to break up the rhythm. Still confirmation coming up on our headphones that, that uh, Romiga has been lashed, but he's still in sight of this little uh, group. He may come back if he can just ride himself through the, the bad patch, but the pain of his knee and thigh may be too much for him. Rushard coming up now on the left-hand side. Number 51 on the screen, that's Burzin. There, Alano in the rainbow bands. Oh, he's fought his way back again. I thought for a minute that, uh, in fact, no, that's, that's Yonker, that is number 15. I just looked at the big body and I thought it was Zula, but it isn't, it's Yonker. Good ride by Yonker, he's not well placed on GC. In fact, he's, uh, what, in 22nd place overall, Yonker, so he's doing very well staying with this group at the moment. Look at this. One way of keeping the lid on things with eight kilometres to go is to send one of your men down the road, which is what they've done here. Ulrich on the front and the yellow jersey on his wheel. He's just gone ahead now of Indurain, who has to pull something out here. Just five miles to go, and it's all uphill, or to be more precise, up a thumping great mountain. You've got to judge it absolutely to perfection on a climb like this. Indrain looking back to see if any of his teammates are there, the answer is no, and Romig is not there either. So that's probably putting Ulrich up into fifth spot on general classification. He started this morning just about 45 seconds down on Romig up. Oh, Reese is coming off the front, Reese is dropping out. Now, is he just going to sit in on the back of this string? Reese has drifted off the front. Now oh, he's gone back to count how many men are there. And he's just, oh, he's just ridden alongside. <laughs> I find this amazing now. Is he done it just to check to see who's there? Because at the moment it's Ulrich on the front, then Indurain, followed by Baronk. And we've got the ref in. He's been going quite well, a nice little climber in there. Not really worrying the rest of the ride at the moment. Uh, Pipoli. Pipoli again is well down General Plastic game. He's 16th at the moment. Well, say well down. He's 10 minutes and 4 seconds in the rears. So this could benefit his performances today. One of the young riders as well in the under 23 competition. And there he's got Reese just on his wheel. The Brock on the other side. Escart in there in the green shorts. Luttenberger poised behind. So possibly Reese has been bold enough to go back there to keep an eye on the race from the rear. The camera following the front end of the group, and as it pops down, right at the bottom of your screen, if it drops again, we can see that um, Ugramov is there, this is Jonker, that's Brochard, that's Bersin, that's Olano, Luttenberger, Reese, Leblanc, Piapoli, Verong. What a roll call this one is, just one man missed it. Look at him wanders back up the front again. <laughs> Hello, chaps, here I am. Good afternoon. Oh, come on, this is amazing. When you think that this group here, about, what, 14 riders, have just blasted everybody else, I mean, down the mountain, there'd be some people coming in here uh, 20 minutes or more down on the on the top men, and it like, makes it look so easy, Reese. You just roll up there, and this is... It's difficult on the, on the, on the motorcycle cameras or in the helicopters to let you see how it goes up and up all the time. It gradually climbs, 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 and the constant pressure you've got to keep putting on the pedals, and Reese just rode past them onto the front, and he's put the pressure on now, He's looking back there. He went back, I think, to count how many men were there, and he came straight to the front, and now he's going to try and ride him off his wheel. I think he's probably observed that Romiga's not there at the moment, so he's going to make him struggle. Well, this is very reminiscent of uh, the ways in which people like Eddie Merckx used to ride the race, and Bernard Hino, they get to the front in the yellow jersey and attack, 
Uh, Indrain was always a calculating rider. He could just stay there all the time, uh, respond to the pressure. And when he had the yellow jersey, he was, he was a man that you couldn't really shake off. But he seldom attacked. He did attack on this stage in 1994, when now Burzin's being distanced. 1994, he and uh, LeBlanc punched something like that five minutes out of the uh, of the field and that confirmed his yellow jersey position and now Berzin has been dropped off Bronk on the front Duke alongside him and nonchalantly Reese rides inside is this just a little sounder again He's doing enormous damage, this man, because he's varying the pace. He drifts back, he then goes quicker, and they've all got to try and get on his wheel. And Bronk is the only one, I think, that's coming across now, and I think behind him is LeBlanc. And what's happened to Indrain? Indrain today has got to try and get back some time. But Indrain's struggling too. Indrain's losing it. There, Alano now looks back. Luttenberger, the specialist climber, can't hold it either. And it's Bjorn Reese that's doing the damage. He said in this race, he said it for days, he said it in the Alps, I'm the strongest, I'm the strongest, and now he's demonstrating just that, and he shelled out Indren, he shelled out Alano, he shelled out Luttenberg, he shelled out Berzin. A nonchalant display of sheer strength. He really is showing that he's the boss. In fact, for Ron, looks like he's having difficulty holding the wheel now as well. Amazing performance by the yellow jersey. He's riding away now. Something we haven't seen for a long, long time. Brilliant. Reese has opened up quite a gap on this stage to Lourdes Hart to come. Getting in towards what I suppose about six or seven kilometers to go towards the top of the climb. And he's romping away up here. It really is a leg breaker, this one. And he's just riding up here as if he was on the flat. The power of this man is shelled out. These two riders from Festina, Dufo and Veronk. LeBlanc, stage victor here in 1994. Can't hold the pace either. And now he's really going to open up. I don't quite know why he's doing it to this degree because he came in today 56 seconds up on Alano. Berzin, who's one of the first to be dropped off together with Rominger, one minute eight seconds. Rominger, one minute 21 seconds down. And he really is opening up the gaps now. Tomorrow the stage goes into Pamplona. It goes right past the Miguel Indrain's front door. And we all thought that perhaps he would keep something in the bag for today to challenge for the yellow jersey. But Reese has shown that he, at the moment, is by far and away the strongest man in this race. He's gone down the road, leaving here. Veron, Dufo, Leblanc and Pierpoli of the refing team. The specialist climbers can't even hold on to a man in the yellow jersey as LeBlanc puts the pressure on. There's no love lost between him and Veronk. If they rode together, they may be able to do something about it. But right now, Reese has gone down the road and the specialist mountain climbers finding themselves in all sorts of trouble. And further back down, Indrain, Alano, Berzin, Romiga, all struggling to stay the pace today. The sun has been beating down on this road, turning it into an absolute cauldron. The noise is deafening for the riders' ears. The sounds of the helicopters, the motorbikes, and the encouragement of the spectators. But as far as they're concerned, They've got a real race on their hands with the yellow jersey way off down the road. And it looks like LeBlanc, who tried to get away, is struggling. And here, Pierre Pildi concentrating on this climb. Indrain struggling at the back. Dufo for company, Ulrich for company, Luttenberger for company. And the struggle shows. Indrain's not going to give up without a big fight. He wanted his sixth victory in the Tour de France. We've never seen such an open race before, but uh, coming onto this stage now, it looks like uh, Reese is going to put the lid on it and say, well, I'm the boss, and you can fight for second and third places from now on in. But they've got a big day in the mountains tomorrow, and that's what I find rather surprising, that uh, Reese has gone away just like this. 
certainly the rest of the field here now 45 seconds adrift of Bjorn Rees a brutal show of strength by this man we saw him do the same thing into Sestria you can see right down the valley when we came through Lourdes and our cameras picked up all the cheering throngs of the pilgrims to Lourdes that was right down there in the valley they came through there with some 20 Nine kilometres to go, and in the final few kilometres, Rees uh, just hammered everybody out of sight. I've said how difficult it is to show the effort they're putting in and the way the road continually grinds upwards but I think you get a better view of it now that's the chasing group trying to get to, up to Reese. way down the valley that's where they've come from and you've been watching it live on Eurosport on this Tuesday afternoon and to think tomorrow these giants of the road have got to tackle some more big climbs the Col de Soule, a first category climb. The Col de Bisque, another first category climb. The Col de Mary Blanc, a second category climb. The Col de Soude, a first category climb. The Port de la Rue, a up category climb. And then over the top of that, they drop down toward the finish in Pamplona with just a couple of fourth category climbs uh, to test the legs. Will anybody have any strength left tomorrow to challenge Reese? He's just shown that he's the gaffer. Now, where has Indrain gone to? He's blown out again. This is something we've not seen for five years in the Tour de France. The strength of this man, he's always set his season around the Tour de France. He's trained himself to perfection. He did it again this year. He looked so strong early on. And with Reese, with five kilometres to go, the gap back to Indrain is unbridgeable now. Flags are waving, and certainly with the gap now at 22 seconds to this group. Rominger on a very, very low gear here. He's got to pedal his way up here without hurting that leg, and he looks like he's coming back to Indurain despite the pain and problems of his leg. He's on his way back up to Indurain, who is really struggling. That's a physical problem from Indurain, and Rominger goes past him, virtually riding on one leg. On your birthday, you ride through Lourdes, you go up towards the finish at Oakcombe. You're looking for a performance that will put you back in with a chance of a yellow jersey, which would have been a record sixth time for this man. But at the moment, it's disappearing down the road on the shoulders of Bjorn Rees. And the gap as we come up here to the five kilometre go point is one minute and 17 seconds back from Rees to Miguel Indrain. Who then can shuttle the pack with that gap? As far as Indrain's concerned, opened up now. Dufo start this morning, just around about 30 odd seconds behind Indurain, and he's in that group chasing, so he might move up as well. Indurain will be struggling to stay in the top ten on the general classification. For a man who's built up sort of a tremendous career in the Tour, Reese has finished fifth, and he's finished third last year, and the gap then, 28 seconds, so it is drifting away a little bit at a time. The Basque flag on the right-hand side, well, they haven't got him to cheer about today because the Basque favourite, Indrain, is further back, and also Alano, who started this morning in second spot over on GC, could well be on his way to losing that one. The demonstration of sheer power here, devastating. 
the field on four kilometres to go. Well, the, the motorcycle just gone past Jindrain down the road, and the commentator's going mad. He said he's très fatigué, and it, there are certain words that in French sound, you know, uh, even stronger than they do in English. And the way the, the, the fellow has just said it over his uh, over his microphone. All 140 back to Berzin. This is 28 seconds of this of the group. One minute 20 seconds to Berzin. Well, Veronk started this morning three minutes, 16 seconds down on Bjorn Rees. Uh, Luttenberger is not with him, and so he could climb over him as well. Ulrich has also been dropped out, so Veronk could well be moving himself up the general classification as riders drop off the pace. So... We could see quite a change overall in the general classification and Indrain dropping further out of the frame. The Danish flag in the background, the riders here being applauded by the massive crowd that have come out here since the crack of dawn. They've been camping out overnight. The road's been closed for something like five hours before the riders came up. They want to witness today to see whether Reese could be under pressure. He's not, he's down the road. A leader of like 28 seconds on this group here as Veronka splashed the water over his teammate Dufo's head. Dufo working very hard with Veronka. He started this morning in ninth spot, Dufo, five minutes and three seconds down on Indorain. Ten seconds back to uh, Romero, just coming up the check at the four-kilometre mark, and Alano is up the road just ahead of him, about ten seconds ahead of him. And in right even further back. And we'll look at this, Romero going to start to ride his way back. He's gone past um, Indorain. A oh, brilliant ride for a man who had had so many troubles with his legs, and he said that um, it was his tour this year. He's trained hard for it, uh, Romero. He wanted to do well in the tour this year. He also said his whole season round it and had the misfortune then to have those problems with his knee. He crashed a couple of times. He'd also got a strain in his uh, thigh. But what would have happened if Romero had been riding 100% fit? I don't know. Now, this is a group of four. Reese has gone down the road looking for his second stage victory in the Tour. He got it into Siesta where he took over the uh, yellow jersey. He took the stage victory and now these four riders here searching only for second spot. But a great ride by Romiger who's clawing his way back up to join them. Ronk on the front. Then Dufo. Then Leblanc. I wonder if uh, Alano and Berzin will be dropping down a bit. And this is the group at the back. Oh, I wish we could stay there a bit longer. That's the team manager, Walter Goldford, coming up to speak to Reese to give him some encouragement on the watchful eye of the commissaire who's waving his bat to tell us to get on, get on, get on, get out the way. The problem is that the motorcycle camera going up here, it has to fight its way through the uh, through the traffic from uh, through all the people who come out into centre as soon as a car goes. They see how they stand forward to look out. Well, the the uh, motorcycle camera has to claw its way through this lot as well. 
And it looks like they're dropping off one of the commissaires to look after the next group coming through. And they want all these motorcycles to go down the road. The noise is intense for Bjorn Reese. Not only the people shouting, but the motorcycles up in front and the fumes coming out from the, uh, from the engines of the motorbikes. And so they want us further on down the road, and I'm not surprised. But you see how the people step forward. It's uh, amazing sometimes. Well, we do have them run into the riders from time to time when they start doing stupid things. Let's hope that Reese stays upright all the way through this mass of people with two kilometres to go, showing tremendous feat of courage and strength to show that he in the yellow jersey is going to be the number one into Paris. But still, we've got tomorrow those big climbs across the Pyrenees. We've then got the run back across on the next day and then the time trial when we all thought that riding in drain was within a couple of minutes of the yellow jersey he might have been able to take the uh, uh, the jersey into paris but that may not be so now if reese continues at this sort of way but you never know you have everybody can have a bad day in the tour so this thing is still right wide open Ronk on the front then leblanc dufo on the right hand side in the festina colors of blue and white and then the good of the ride from pierre Poli just sitting in behind. He certainly has become good towards the back end of the race, as uh, Pipoli. And the gap then, now 55 seconds, according to my watch here. So he's going away still. You see in the distance, he's still got a long old climb to do. Reese looking for yet another stage victory today. And the gap, the last one was 55 seconds back to the four men. He's rocking a bit. Is he under pressure? Russell, team manager, saying, come on, you two, ride at it, ride at it, ride at it. Dufo is doing a wonderful job here for Veronk on the front. And I think uh, the team manager is wanting uh, Veronk now to put the pressure on and start the ride. And look at Rominger here, burying himself to stay in contention. Brush on the left-hand side, Alana just behind him, Ulrich there in the pink and white, and there the ball top of the head of Ugramov. Eskatin still there for the Kalme team in the green. What a great ride that uh, Romiga's doing. Duvant de, the, uh, the gap back to... Um, Miguel Indurain, two minutes, 22 seconds is the gap back to Miguel Indurain. Devant de, so Indurain is struggling. One coming to go for this raiding Viking from Denmark, going straight through the crowd here. And now he's OK because they've got the barriers out for the whole final kilometre. 55 seconds, the last time check we had for him back to the chasing group. Reese is burying himself here. Look at the strain on his face. He's riding like a man possessed. He's done tremendous damage today. But what is he taking out of himself to do it? We've seen men crack before when they've tried to go out and demonstrate their sheer strength. And his legs seem to be going a bit slower now. He lost some weight before he came into the Tour this year to help him on the climbs. It certainly proved, as he dropped away up to Siesta, that he's found a great ability to go up the mountains. And this gap then... So the gap is still around about 50 seconds back to Veronk here, then Dufo with LeBlanc in the third spot in this little group of four men, and Pierre Pelli are just behind them. Another time check coming up here at this point. 
In fact, it's going, it's in fact one minute and two seconds at that particular point, so I can't see them pulling back. Bjorn Rees now, this determined rider from the telecom team, is down the road, ridden everybody off his wheel. Alano started to accelerate, and it looks like a triumphant, almost lap of honour for Bjorn Rees, the way he came up that mountain and shed everybody off his wheel. It looked like he's struggling a bit just with that one kilometre to go. Look at him waving at the crowd here. What a demonstration of strength we've seen today. As the gap now has opened up all the way through from Bjorn Rees to those contenders for the crown. He could be in yellow when we get to Paris on Sunday. He's got yet another stage victory. So Bjorn Rees takes the stage to Hodokom. He took the one in Sestria when he took the uh, uh, yellow jersey. And certainly now he's shown that he is the strongest man in the race. The mountain climbers who we thought might put him under pressure today, the people we're looking at now, didn't do so. But why they're racing up here so quickly is that they want, in fact, uh, to help put Veron. Not only will he keep the pink uh, polka dot jersey as king of the mountains, but also he'll try and close that gap down uh, so he'll move up on general classification. He started seventh this morning, did... Uh, Baronk, and he's now racing in, trying to get second spot. His teammate Dufo, there's work with him, is just behind him. They've seen off LeBlanc. The man who won here in 1994 is in the yellow jersey of uh, the Pulte team, but he's not going to get a second or a third today. Looks like fourth for LeBlanc, but the man coming across, 49 seconds down, Baronk, for the polka dot jersey. Stayed to Hodakom, second spot for him, and look as they come in here, the gaps. Udramov. Then Ulrich, Rominger. Rominger has to save every second he can do. Berzin's way down the mountain. What a brilliant ride by Rominger, despite that sore leg. He's showing strength, determination. He started this morning, one minute, 21 seconds down on Bjorn Rees. He's going to lose another minute and a half here. Rominger, the hour record holder. Could still do a very good time trial indeed. As Escartin brings Alano up the climb. Escartin, 10th this morning on GC. Could just about keep his place there. But this is the man who's lost the most today. Berzin has also lost a lot of time. So for Indrain, who started four minutes and 38 seconds down on Bjorn Rees, you can now read probably the thick end of seven minutes, distancing himself from the yellow jersey. Unless some miracle can happen tomorrow when Indrain can go away on that uh, very mountain stay to Pamplona, we're probably seeing the end of his ambitions for the tour this year. Berzin likewise, well that was my favourite, I thought he would come good. They're all saying when we get to the Pyrenees, we'll set about Bjorn Rees, well he had other thoughts. And still all of them have arrived themselves into a frazzle to keep as close as they can to the Rees. We've got a big day tomorrow, we've got the time trial in two days time as well. Two fifty-nine down for Berzin. So he's now nearly four minutes down overall in classification to Bjorn Rees. Luggenberger probably stopping a bit from his tour of Switzerland when he rode so hard. We thought he might challenge in the mountains, but uh, sixth overall this morning, two minutes thirty-eight seconds down. Look, he's lost another three minutes. Jonker, well, he was. What, down about um, 17th place, I suppose, this morning, or even perhaps further back than that. He makes 20 seconds, so that's a good ride for him today. And for Fernandez Jeans, for Mappe. Mappe very strong, you can see, with Olano, Rominger, and uh, Fernandez Jeans in the team. So I think Mappe will have got the award today, three men in there. Uh, this, uh, this is Rooks coming in, isn't it? Who tried so hard to win the stage today. 
and that was a very spirited performance by him. He's bound to take the, uh, I think, the most aggressive rider award of the day. And he's ridden himself absolutely to a standstill to try and get the stage. And at the end of it all, comes in four minutes and ten seconds down on the victor, Bjorn Rees. Tour de France leader Bjorn Rees won the 16th stage and moved a giant step closer to overall victory today. The Dane destroyed the opposition with a brilliant solo ride, coming home 50 seconds ahead of second place Richard Viranque and Laurent Dufault in third after 199 gruelling miles. So Rees now has a 2 minute 42 seconds advantage over world champion Abraham Olano, who could only finish 11th today. Miguel Indurain has dropped from 8th to 10th, and it would now take a miracle for the Spaniard to score a record 6th win. Considerable time on his pursuers to move a giant step closer to victory in Paris, where it all ends on Sunday. Bjorn Rees saluting the crowd proved today that he would be a worthy champion of the world's most famous and toughest cycle race. The Tour de France is brought to you on Eurosport by Coca-Cola, always for the fans. Neil Stevens rolling along here. You can see on his hat, by the way, that uh, black patch and the little white shape in the centre. That's the little symbol of a blind person with the, the white stick, because Anse being the Institute for the Blind in uh, Spain, they have great big lotteries where they get the money to support the Blind Institute. And we had uh, last year in the Tour of Spain when it finished a mass turnout uh, of the Spanish onsays to cheer on Jalabert, who unfortunately is not in this race now, having had uh, gastroenteritis, and the hope of uh, France was eliminated through uh, physical problems. Neil Stevens, we see here last year, if you saw the stage when went to demand, when Jalabert on stage 14 won that stage and absolutely thrashed the rest of the field and gave Indra a fright of his life last year. Well, uh, Neil Stevens was in that breakaway group. He's a great worker and now he's got his moment of glory in the front because uh, Zula's not going so well for the Anse team having had a couple of crashes he tried yesterday Zula did on the climb up to Otacom to get away but he just blew in the end and uh, they all rode past him so when you have those sort of problems in the team if top man's gone his second man isn't so good then people like Stevens can, can go off down the road and he's done just that today and he got for his uh, pains the climb of the Col d'Orbisque, where there was a special prize in memory of uh, Arnie de Grange. Then that went to, 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 to Neil Stevens when he got himself uh, uh, some 20,000 French francs at about uh, two and a half or 2,300 quid. So he's already put some money in the bank. But of course, they're missing the performance of the Jalabert, which last year earned the, uh, the, the, the team a lot of money. This is the chasing group then between the three at the front and this uh, group of some seven men. We have Fondé still. In no man's land. That's uh, Sorensen on the front. The rider from Mappe just drifted away. He uh, jumped away and started the attack going. And still, I think Mappe have got to try and do something today if they're going to shake uh, the tree at all as far as uh, Bjorn Reese is concerned. Reese, by the way, I understand from our German commentator uh, Peter Voigt, is the Danish equivalent of giant. Well, the giant of a man is in there in the yellow jersey. Unperturbed yesterday, the way in which he won the stage and just slashed everybody's hopes to be. So perhaps right now they're just happy to last the stage today and tomorrow and the next day and then get the time to have and done with and rush off to uh, Paris for the finish. It's been a very closely fought uh, Tour de France. Gone a little bit quiet since Reese has suddenly shown how strong he is. We hoped yesterday perhaps a gap would come down, but he was so, so strong. And I think that the whole of Denmark were packing his bag with toothbrushes and belting off down to Paris for Sunday. We've been familiar in the Champs-Élysées with the noise from the Spaniards who come and make a, uh, a lot of uh, a noise on the, on the finishing line up and down the Champs-Élysées. Uh, I'm sure another of them will come anyway this time to cheer the Spanish heroes, but I think they're going to be outnumbered by the Danes 
uh, providing that uh, Reese gets to Paris in one piece without the other jersey on his back. But that's Sunday, we're still here on Wednesday on the stage taking the riders into Spain, 262 kilometres all told. Right, you've just eaten your sandwich, Russell, it's your turn to speak, I'm going to have mine. Bon appetit, eh? So Bartoli just on the front here, this is his first Tour de France, He's, he came into the Tour de France with excellent form actually, winning a stage in the uh, Tour of Switzerland. I noticed that Bartoli's got um, the, little, the, uh, the little sticky plaster on the nose which gives him the extra breathing capacity. Riding very, very comfortably here, the three riders, just on the back in the pink jersey, is on says Neil Stevens. So with the Onsay team falling apart, gives Neil Stevens a good chance to show what class he's got. Because what usually happens is the start of the year he trains really hard and uh, gets good results and the rest of the year from sort of uh, May onwards he's got to really work for Jalabert and Zula. And uh, of course Laurence Jalabert's had to pull out for injury and uh, Zula's had a, a few crashes. So obviously the team director said, well, you know, at least we can have, have a few stages. And uh, two days ago he was in a, a race winning move and crashed on the roundabout where his tyre rolled off. So maybe this is a chance for today, if we go back to the main group. Motorbike camera in there trying to get the excellent shots for the, the good pub publications like Cycling Weekly. As we go back to, the, and this is actually the uh, the third group, we've got the three leaders, we've got one rider in Fond and we've got this group here, and this is Udo Boltz in the pink of the telecom. He's a good climb, he's looking around. Team car start to come up, start to talk to the riders. Abdu Jabarov, the big sprinter, is on the back there. So we've got Sorensen in there as well. This is Arietta, the uh, Benesta rider who got across before it was too late. Udo Boltz is looking down, looks like he's got something wrong with his bike. The Spanish Mape rider starting to come through, zips undone. I think he stopped back there. Um, Bolts. Bolts. Yeah, yeah, there he is. Yeah, Bolt is in some sort of trouble now. Possibly bike trouble. But the rest of the riders, they, they just continue on. Ralph Sorensen. Sorensen, not really renowned as, a, as, you know, in the big climbs, you know, in the little climbs earlier in the year, in things like Liège, Brest and Liège, he can get over. But these big climbs, he really does suffer, but it just shows his class. And it looks like in this group as well, there's a lot of riders actually not working, as we say there. Bolt is getting back onto the group. The Frattini, the Italian in the light blue, he's just been sitting on for a while, so is Jackie Duran. Interesting that, because normally if you've got to say a puncture, you, you put your arm up and the, the, the team car is prepared, but he, he, went, he went on the front, and just pulled, pulled over, drifted towards the back, and then next thing he's off his bike and back again, so it must have been a quick change. And you're talking wheel. about the, um, the sort of uh, triathlon handlebars, you notice Udo Boltz has sort of got him there. Mm. Jackie Duran's really starting to hurt here on the back. Yeah, he's another big fellow, isn't he? Yeah. But, um, he doesn't look comfortable. He's sort of labouring there with the big gear. And saying that, Frattini as well, he's more known as a climber, is, is just sitting, sitting behind him. But the trouble is, if you sit behind someone who's going to get out, who's going to go out in the back, you're in all sorts of trouble. And as I say that, he's slowly losing ground. He's really try he's trying to find a right gear. He's really starting to struggle. His hand on his top, he's starting to weave around the road as it gets steeper. Big Jackie Duran. Oh, come on, Jackie. If you look down, he's on the small chain ring, he's on the small sprockets there, possibly 39, 22, and his legs are actually screaming now in pain. He's looking down, he's trying to, trying to get into some sort of rhythm. This is how the big men suffer, and how the little men can just bounce up these mountains. It's, a, it's, a, it's an inborn skill to a large extent for the, for the gifted mountain climbers, but you can... Uh, 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 teach yourself to climb, you can work at it, but uh, as far as Jackie's ground is concerned, it's uh, not in his legs. He's better for rolling on the undulating surfaces, uh, on the sort of uh, short, sharp climbs of, uh, of northern France and Belgium. He can cope with those, but right now, the man's with a hammer's got at him. And don't forget that we see these riders suffering like this. It isn't just today, one day in the Tour de France we're watching. They've been actually racing now. This is the, uh, the 16th stage, sorry, 17th stage of the Tour de France. They've been racing something like about 1,700 miles so far in this race. And uh, the, 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 the pain is beginning to tell that they're getting exhausted. They, although they sleep well at night, they eat a lot of food. The physical damage that's done to their bodies just drains them bit by bit. And Jackie Durant just can't stand the pace. 
Yeah, and this this we're down to a group of six now. We've got three good, three great, three really good climbers and three sort of, as you could say, not so good climbers. And that's the main group. They've been well and truly off the back as regards the leading three, some of the biggest gap we had, what, six minutes and 15 seconds. It's been hovering around about the five and a bit for an awful long time. And now at the moment seems to be busy to uh, close that gap down. And this is the climb they're on now of the Col de Sude. This is the first category climb. On the way up to here, they're going to be climbing for 18 kilometres in all. That's uh, just over 10 miles of climbing. They've been over the Col de Suleur, 18.5 kilometres of climbing. Over the Col de Bisque, 7.5 kilometres of climbing. Over the Col de Mary Blanc, 8.6 kilometres of climbing. And now on the Col de Sude, 3.45 back. And 6.40, so the gap has gone back up again. main group it looks like uh, one of the Festina riders in the shop is Laurent Defoe tucked in second place is the Zurich the young German third place in the polka dot there is Voronk moving all over his bike he's not the prettiest of climbers at times is he but he seems to be thrashing a bit more than normal it just shows you how the mountain is affecting these riders and very quickly onto his wheel goes the eternal shadow the figure in yellow of uh, Leblanc and they've opened up a little bit of a gap at the moment, four riders back, another gap further back down that. So is this the yeah, they have to be careful reaction we've been uh, waiting for? Eh? If it's beyond Reese, actually. There's beyond Reese. I'm surprised he's let such a gap open ah, up. Ah, that, that's Rominger. And there's Alano. And uh, Reese has let a gap open up. We've got four men here, and coming up very quickly indeed is a group which includes uh, Romigo. Uh, in that little group up in front is, is Veronk and Lebon, and they come up very quickly indeed. Now the gap's opening up, one rider on his own. I think that's Ugramov in the uh, yellowish coloured Rosalotto uh, shirt com coming across now to join up with that one. And where is Reese? This is not good for Bjorn Reese. He actually should get across to this gap as, as soon as possible. Eurix's Eurix there, the young German, just doing a fabulous ride. Sometimes I just think to myself, what, what could he actually do if he wasn't riding for Telecom, if he wasn't riding for Bjorn Rees? Well, I hope our camera goes back. I'll try and listen to race radio now about that. Um, oh, Aparicio's. Aparicio's abandoned. That's another one gone. So a couple of abandoned riders today. The damage being done by the two riders on the front, but more so, I think, than the climb they're on now. It's just the heat, the intensity of the racing that they've had so far. So Lietti, the MG boy, is gone as well. And the teammates of Bartoli, he won't know until he gets to the hotel tonight. <laughs> his teammates has pulled out. So this is interesting, a little group of one, two, three, four, five. Since there are more riders getting across to it now, as we say that, the world champion Alano is just on the back of it to make it six. This is interesting, Bjarne Reese is not in this move yet. That is quite a useful gap now. I've got my watch on it to see uh, what the gap is between that group, which included last time we saw not only Olana but Rominger too, and I reckon that gap is around about 12 seconds. Is this the move we've been waiting for? Because in that little group then, Olano struggling to stay in contention. On the general classification this morning, Olano second overall, 2 minutes 42 seconds down on the yellow jersey. He's just off the tail of that one now, 2, 4, 5, 6 rider back. And it's splitting further down the mountain. So 
for beyond reason yellow is sitting in second position just behind Ugramov. and this is the second group this is it sorry the second part of the bunch and it looks as if Rominger is with Reese at the moment so they've let Alano go originally it seemed that Rominger was starting to move up as well and whilst we're now going up onto the little leading group who've been away ever since the, well, it's the start of the day I suppose with uh, Herve went off on the first Col de Sola and uh, then the thing broke again on the way down when Stevens and uh, Pascal uh, were joined sorry but Stevens and uh, Bartoli joined up with Pascal Herve so they've been out there now. We're on this particular climb at the top. It'll be 112 kilometres of racing. They've done about 100 kilometres on their own. And now the yellow jersey is starting to go here. It looks like he's got uh, uh, Indre with him as well. And there, Ugramov is just behind them. <laughs> on the road are there for Indre, but he's way down the road and he's been dropped and distanced by the yellow jersey yet again. So for all the preparation that uh, the spectators have made on the side of the road to welcome the Spanish champion into his home territory uh, it looks like uh, his moment has gone to win the stage unless something miraculous happens on the drop off the top of this climb we've still got ahead of us the big one of the Port de la Roa, a hope category climb and uh, that will certainly wreak havoc for anybody who can't uh, match the pace up here the wearing down process goes on a yellow jersey is the one that's responded to all the mountain climbers moves and just uh, this group here now Closing up on our leading threesome, probably about a minute's gap. So Tudor bolts back on the front of the group. Going through the yellow jersey now of the Polte is Luke LeBlanc. as if Leblanc, uh, sorry, uh, uh, Veronk is beginning to struggle a bit at the back, he's rocking his head more than normal and uh, or is he just lying and having a bit of, a, bit of a, a breather at the back? Certainly Veronk, for the first time in all the mountain climbs we've seen him, doesn't look too comfortable now and it's Ulrich at the front, in fact it's Ulrich and Bolts, there are three telecom riders there now aren't there, if I can see correctly through the trees. Yeah, and we're always talking about strength in teams who they were starting the same at the start of this year that um, Benesto, you know, wasn't very strong, but they, you know, they, they couldn't care less about the rumours. So the telecom team have proved themselves to be the strongest one, and I'm saying it looked like Festina might be in the shout for a stage victory today. In fact, the, the telecom have now got three men in this breakaway group, and they've got uh, same numbers as have uh, Festina, but uh, Verong, having taken a breather, starts to work his way through past... Uh, Luttenberger in the career colours and LeBlanc has gone back to the tail end of the group leaving the telecoms on the front with Reese there in third spot. Just one kilometre to go for the three leaders who are now getting very worried indeed. The gap is coming down, a gap which at one time was six minutes and 40 seconds back to the yellow jersey group. As they came to the bottom of the climb the Col de Sude, they still got the thick end of five minutes lead, but it's all come down on this uh, climb. And they're getting up there. You see the uh, uh, team cars, or the, the uh, service car, going away now, out of sight. They, they move the vehicles forward because once they start dropping off the top, they go down so quickly that the riders need all the room they can and therefore the team cars, the uh, service cars are going away and Stevens is also going away. Neil Stevens, what a tremendous ride we've had today for this man. He took the special prize up the Col d'Abisque. Sorry, Col d'Abisque. Oh, engage your mouth at the same time as your brain, David. Um, and got 20,000 French francs for his trouble. And he's seen the danger now as Neil Stevens. He's going to get himself another 4,000 francs for the, his trouble of being out there uh, to add to the, the coffers of the Anse team. 
but the the telecom train is grinding away here remorselessly up the hill and the yellow jersey still in the midst of that little group uh, Good afternoon to all you people back in Great Britain and the Sports Cafe too. I understand it's gone at 12 o'clock. The doors are open. They're swarming in, the 100 people, to be having a few bevies with the, uh, the lads from cycling. Welcome to Eurosports coverage if you just come to the door. This is Neil Stevens, who's had a very sprightly day today, the bold Neil. He went away on the... Uh, descent of the Col de Sulor to catch up with Pascal Herve who had started the move early on this morning with Montoya and now Stevens is doing a great ride here because going over the top of the Col de Sulor he's had now something like uh, what 90 kilometers either uh, on his own or with that leading threesome brilliant ride by Neil given up his responsibility to Schulting Zulla and uh, his on team captain uh, Jalabert who retired from the race a great performance here by a man who was recognised by the uh, Australian government for his services to sport only uh, what, Phil Anderson also had the, the same award from the uh, government for his services to, to sport and here he comes in just about staying away as the big one sweep over right behind only 12 seconds he timed that to perfection did uh, Neil Stevens to take the climb of the Col de Suda who would have thought would have seen Neil Stevens registering so many he got to first on the Col de Bisque he got third uh, on the sprint at La Ronde, and then when they went up the Col de Mary Blanc he got that one as well so Stevens so far has had a first two yes three first climbs he's got he's had the uh, first climb at the Col de Bisque first category, he had won the Col de Mary Blanc and he's had the Col de Sude as well. Watch the clock run, there Fondriest on the left hand side had been away on his own, wedged in no man's land between the three leaders and the chasers. Uh, Sorensen's done a great ride to get up uh, to that yellow jersey group, he's collected Fondriest on his way up and the question is, looking at the clock that's running there, what has happened to Alano, what has happened to Romigo, they both got shelled out and also got shelled out on the climb was uh, Miguel Indurain, who really began to struggle yet again under the pressure of the yellow jersey. Bjorn Rees, who looks so strong going up with the mountain specialist, and now down the other side of the descent. Uh, Rees is such a good descender, I think it's going to be very difficult if he decides to stay away. Steady! Oh, oh, oh. That was close. <laughs> Just misjudged that a little bit. Well, let's hope we go back to see what's happened to Alano and to uh, Romagas. Here we are, there's Romagas in this group now. And it looks like they've swept up. Yes, there's Alano as well. I think they've swept up in Miguel Indurain. Yeah, Miguel Indurain's in there as well. With Big Mig. Bo Hamburger in that group too. Fernandez Jeans, the Mape rider, who's the champion of Spain. Looks like Alex Zulu on the back there in the pink. 2.04 back then. <laughs> Mappe well represented in this little group here, but I think that... Romigo, as he's pedalling, he's almost give, giving his right leg a uh, little bit out to the side and, and almost, obviously, riding with one leg, but it's certainly paining him. You can see that. And Stevens has taken it into his head to get the hell out of there. Good on your sport. Well, I hope later on that we should be able to talk to some of the people at the Sports Cafe in London, where Psyching having the big gathering. I spoke to Neil Stevens last night, and uh, he sent a message, if I can find them, amongst the thousands of notes we got here, uh, to the lads back there, in particular to uh, Robert Miller and to... Uh, and as Sean Yates are going to be gathering in the uh, in the group, he said, uh, bid him good day for me, bid him good day. And uh, so Neil sounded in fine form, you know, when I spoke to him, he looked good, he sounded good, and uh, he said that uh, last year, you know, he had to fight uh, for Jalabert, and to a large uh, extent now the, the team have lost its spirit because without Jalabert being there and Zola having fallen off a couple of times, but... Uh, he felt quite positive about his form, did Neil, and he's done a great, great ride today, and he's going off the top of this uh, mountain in the lead, but I think the Mr. Reese, who's a very good descender, might snap him up yet. Neil's also, other comment was, he felt that the, yesterday when uh, Reese rode away and got the stage victory, it was just a psychological uh, a twist of the screw, whilst he certainly gained a bit of time on his main uh, uh, rivals, he, he really rode that hard just to make everyone else realise he was back, uh, was the boss and psychologically uh, knocked them all back a bit. 
Also for English viewers, by the way, Neil says he's going to ride the Le Leeds Classics uh, after the Olympics. So they can give him a cheer when he gets climbing up the old home moss. You'll be there, Russell, won't you? Well, the actual, the, uh, the team and... Team Ambrosia are actually riding, so uh, I have to find out from the director if I'm actually riding as well. It's we'll look out for you. 156 you miles, sport. is it? Hey. 156 miles, I believe. Something like that, yes, yes. But then straight after that, Sport for Television are putting on uh, three uh, television races in, uh, in Glasgow and Rochester and also Brighton. So that should be great. Over the top there, we can see Abdu Jafarov and Claudio Kirpucci. Abdu has also been very sprightly today as he goes through there with his uh, group of riders. That's him there in the reddish colour without the hat on the centre. What a revelation he's been in the Tour this year, taking his stage victory, the lone ride. And Neil Stevens writing himself a bit of history, I think, with the number of mountain climbs that he's had so far. The Col de Soleil, that is confirmation that Stevens was first ahead of Veronk, Gorn Rees in third spot. Rocketing down here to steady 45, 50 miles an hour. So we're going to take a short break. Hold your breath, we'll be back. If I could be... Although certainly after the problems that Alana and Romiga have suffered and dropped back a bit, there'll be some movements up there with uh, the general classification shifting a little bit with Ulrich moving up. Bronk now probably going up into, into third spot. But, of course, when it comes to the, the time trial stage, I think that's what uh, Rhys has been doing. He's an extremely good time trial. Last year on the Huy Sarang, he was five seconds up on Miguel Indrain with about uh, five kilometres to go for the finish. He finished 12 seconds down. I don't think he's too worried about the time trial. Uh, Rhys, when he looks around, this is a lot he's got with him here because he's also an extremely good time trial. At 62 kilometres, he's not exactly the sort of uh, type of bike race. And these chaps you're looking at here really want... Right, LeBlanc there, we're trying to get some water, just from one of the uh, spectators at the side of the road there. Going to get a drink before we go over the top of the climb. Bronx got his hand up, because he wants a team car as well, maybe a drink or... So Richard Bronk in the polka dot jersey in a comfortable position in the mountain competition. Looking around, he's got his hand up for his team car, so is Luke LeBlanc as well. LeBlanc's team car is right there, the Polte car. Richard Bronx looking for his car. So LeBlanc gets his drink there. Bronx's hand's going up. What happens is, simply puts his hands up the... Uh, just behind this group is the commissaire, and the commissaire goes on over the radio just to uh, indicate for the car to come up, and as you can see by the way he said to his mouth, he's uh, wants something to eat as well. As we go back to the great champion now, we've got in around five times through the tour. Everybody's favourite for this year's tour, but um, like they say, c'est la vie, that's just the way it goes. This is what I like. He, um, the director put his hand out for him, and he just holds on for it for a few seconds, so it just like, sort of pulls the rider along a little bit. There goes uh, Laurent Defoe, the Swiss rider from the same team, even though they've got different jerseys. Getting something to eat as well. Some last minute information. The team director is just telling him, he's, if you keep riding like this, Richard, you can move up to the top three. Even better than what you imagined. So if Richard Ronk still wants something else from the, uh, from the team car, These top riders make it look so, so easy. Remember, this is one of the major climbs of today. Another bottle there for Richard Veron. Just holds on, a little push off. And as you can see from the front of the, front of the group this time, it's beyond recent yellow jersey who's, who's setting the tempo. It's amazing, people always ask me, they say, well, where's the rest of the riders? But remember, there's 150 riders started this morning. 156, I think, or 146, the best riders in the world. 134, to be exact. Oh, there we go, there we go. <laughs> We've been shelling them out. We lost uh, you know a couple of riders abandoned, too. I was just having a listen then, uh, Russell, see if I can get, get back on our race radio, the, uh, the gap back to Indorain, but uh, I've not picked up at the moment. Certainly, he's really suffering today. You know what upset me is when we lost a Japanese rider? Yes. I, I was... Uh, 
I was hoping he's going to be. I understand that he's outside the time limit or something one day because uh, they actually published him as being in the field the next day, and then suddenly it, it, it disappeared and it wasn't. So uh, it looks like um, because, uh, he's outside the time limit. No, the Japanese like to do. I think he would have kept going and going and going. So this is the elite group at the front. Beyond Reese in the yellow jersey, setting the tempo. Touches behind him is his young teammate, Ulrich. Followed by Ugamov. And Beyond Reese looks so, so comfortable. Started this morning, 2 minutes 42 seconds in front of Alano. Tony Rominger was down at 3.54. And then now those two are over four minutes back. And what a sight, you're going uphill and you, you're looking up even more. <laughs> the different styles of the climbers. The sheer strength of the front of Bjorn Reese in the yellow jersey, just sitting there comfortably, just pedalling. Richard Veronk's out of the saddle, moving all over his bike. Fantastic crowds. It, it, look at this, so you get the yellow jersey back on the front. You know, he, he, he's done that time and time again, and uh, he's really making people suffer uh, this time. It looks as if Indrain's probably coming back now. He's, he's got onto the Italian's wheel, and he's going back up, I think, to the little group with uh, with Romiga and Olano. So he's obviously gone through his bad patch. This is a, a slightly flatter part of the course. You can see the distance there, that although they're still climbing over toward the top of the uh, of the mountain, it's not quite as steep, although then, <laughs> having said that, it suddenly pops up again. And a good ride there by the other Australian, Patrick Yonkers. He's uh, riding really well. And amongst all the Basque flags, we've got the Basque collection of... Uh, Flags from all over the world, including I've seen that the Danish flag's going, and uh, I wonder if anybody is up there still brewing the Carlsberg or baking the bacon or producing the Lego bricks. I said Lego, by the way, not Lego. Uh, it's still it working for Channel 4. I don't know how they're going to cram uh, all this racing into their half hour programme tonight. One thing about uh, on Eurosport when you're getting the live thing all the way through, pardon me, you can get bored to tears with, with me chatting away here. You do see everything that moves, and we try and bring you the best on our screens here. And uh, Brian Benner does an amazing job in London to, to, for Channel 4 to put together a half-hour programme which brings to people who can't see the promotion. Oh, oh. oh, no, it looks like he's got knocked off his bike by one of the spectators or something, because he's punctured. Hopefully we can come back to that, Richard Verron. The thing to do is not to panic now. Look, Laurent Defoe, his teammates, come back for him, but the way he's sprinting straight back up there. I wonder if he just went off the road or hit a spectator. But the true teammate there, Laurent Defoe, even though he's in fifth place overall, he's thinking about his team, team leader and team captain. The thing that if we're wrong to do now is not to panic, it's just to come back up to him gently. That's what he's doing, he's pushing the spectators out of the way. I think what actually happened, he probably hit one of those spectators. They do step out, you see, particularly when, the, you know, to see round each other. Uh, and it's a hell of a job. And of course, the other problem is if you get a motorcycle up in front to push the people out of the way, you get all the fumes and all the noise off the motorbike, so they've got to force their way through. And look at this great mass of spectators now getting up towards the top of this climb of uh, the Port de Lado. This is the problem then. See, they're trying to run up there. This is absolutely stupid. Right, I've got a job to do today. They've been racing since half past nine this morning, and they get these nutty people rushing out across the road like that. I know there's enthusiasm there for the race that's going on, but my goodness, they should stand back. Four minutes and 40 seconds back to Alano and Indrain, and this group here, which is giving us something to cheer about today. A massive crowd welcome up here. Look at the way they're here all across the road at the moment. The riders pushing their way through. For some reason, there isn't a motorcycle closer to the moment, forcing their way through, and there Richard Baronk nearly brought down by one of the spectators. All you can do is point your bike straight down the middle and keep going and hope you can force your way through. So Baronk takes the final big climb of the day over the Port de Lalo. We've got two more climbs yet to come, the Cote de Garita and the Alto de Garalda, but both those two climbs are uh, fourth category and are not going to be a long old grind like we've just seen.
as they go over the top here now and over into Spain. So Bjorn Reis, Bjorn Reis actually put his hand up there. I don't know if he needs uh, something from the car. That's why the telecom car's coming up there because Bjorn Reis had his hand up. Festina car's coming up for Richard Ronkstoff. It looks like he's got some trouble with his bike. Is it a puncher? I look. think he's punctured the back wheel. Yeah, back wheel. So a nice change here. Should take more, no more than about 15 seconds. Is that Ronk's trying to, trying to help the mechanic at the same time? Yeah, you leave the mechanic to do the work. He's the expert. It's like he gets a bit of a push because he's on the descent. I think he must have punctured right at the top. He rode uh, over the top and then pulled out because there was no room up there with the spectators. Uh, and on the descent now, a chance for him to get back into that group. Yeah, I don't think he'd have any difficulty getting back on again. Laurent Defoe will probably ease up and wait for him. He's just talking to his team director there. He was talking to the cameraman, actually. We go off, that's it. We go, when we go to the tunnel, we lose our signal. So, and here is Indrain. The chase is on for Richard Veronk, but uh, he's got another hat full of points then in the King of the Mountains competition, taking that one up the top of the Port de Lado, uh, up category climb. Just uh, adjusting his, his back brake there to make sure it's not rubbing uh, on the tyre, on the rim. I'm intrigued the way in which they're now going to, to, to nine sprockets on the back as well, to think that the problems that people have in, in, in changing wheels, because if your team car does the wheel change for it's fine, uh, some of them racing on eight, some of them racing on nine, and I believe um, that the uh, nine sprocket on the back calls for a thinner chain, so if somebody gives you an eight sprocket, you'll be in trouble, A, because you're... Uh, your, your index gear system won't quite work, and B, I don't think the chain does either, so you've got to make sure, because when I looked on the on the Mavic car the other day, uh, not only do they have this problem of people riding with, with, with different sorts of sprockets, but also um, we have the uh, uh, the problem of the different sort of, of uh, pedals they're using, Whether so the, 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 the car on the back of the Mavic service vehicle, I had a look at it, he got to three different sorts of bikes with three different sorts of pedals on them for the riders who uh, had to change over. That's right, I mean, the main sort of pedals they're using now is either the look, the look type, which is uh, local Shimano or, or Yuzi the Time. So at the top of that climb there, we had Varonk going over in first place. Any chance to speak to Sport Cafe in London, please? So it looks like Richard Varonk's back onto the main group, what? or he's back onto the, the other jersey group. Yeah, the three riders have got a little gap there. So Bronx is trying to close the gap on these three riders just to just got 20 metres ahead. Well, we're trying to get through to the uh, Sports Cafe in London and I hope we can get another call there because Sean Yates has passed the comments through here um, and we've got the notes that he said that the stage looks like hell uh, with the pure climbers in front and he feels really sorry for uh, Irene with, uh, injuring with the tour passing his, his front, uh, front door as such. So it's not good to see him having such a bad time and uh, though the stage set for perhaps a sprint for the leading group with the last series climb just coming. Anyway, we shall see what happens. Thank you for the comments there. And um, Sean is in super, steer super serious form on non-spiked tomato juice. <laughs> I see. OK, well, we'll try and uh, see. As now Romiger forces his way through the crowd, the uh, riders here having to do the same that the leaders did, force their way through. What a, what a tremendous day we're having in the Tour de France. Everybody said this would be a cracking stage, and everybody thought that Indre might be riding triumphantly into Spain in the yellow jersey. It's not so. He just got back onto this group here with uh, uh, Tony Romga on the front. Romiger, who's recovered from the problems he's had with his knee, it has certainly affected his performance in the race so far. The gap on the left-hand side, you can see 4.34, as the police are just trying to control the crowd, it's almost an impossible task, as now Romiger, who set his heart on winning the Tour de France this year, is struggling to come up here. It looks like he's certainly going to drop off the general classification where he started uh, this morning, and he's going to be out of the top three. But it's not over yet because when we've gone across the top of the, the climb here, which has been absolute purgatory in the sunshine, as far as these riders are concerned, they've now got uh, in, and they've covered 155 kilometres. They've still got 100 and, uh, uh, what, 11, 110 kilometres to go? Yeah, they're about mind-blowing, isn't it? Yeah, that chasing group of Tony Robinson just got over the climb and straight away they all up their tin of coke. 
LeBlanc just hanging off the back of the, the front group here. Well, that's it. They're dropping down the mountain now. It'll give us time for us to get our breath back because they have uh, done the damage on the climb now and we'll be back with you in just a couple of minutes. Neil Stevens, having recovered, uh, he had a breakaway of what's well over 100 kilometres as such today, collected himself a nice little uh, prize of 20,000 French francs on the top of the, uh, the Col d'Obisque. He also collected something like about uh, 4,000 francs for all the other three climbs he went over as well, so he's got a few bob in his back pocket today to show for his troubles, but uh, he did the right thing. He sat in the back of this group while he recovered. He's now come through. Then Romiger's working on the front. Five minutes and uh, what was it, 12 seconds last time, 5.17 the last time gap we had and Tony Romero just quick flick of the gear uh, change then now trying to cut the gap on this uh, leading group who haven't missed a beat have they now this group of seven riders been going through all, all doing about 250 meters on the front and swinging off coming to the last 40 kilometers the yellow jersey with well, 25 case the yellow jersey Bjorn Rees going through followed closely by Luke LeBlanc Laurent Defoe on the back, they're having a drink, the Festina car comes up, he's going to talk to the two riders now. Obviously Festina looking for their, uh, they've yet to win a stage yet, have they? Um, quick check, because my memory isn't always working that well. I can't remember okay. getting to the stage, no. Nope. Uh, they could do the stage victory. We'll have a little look through this, uh, this, this paper chase here as to what... Um, I can't remember the winning one. Not now, not at the moment. So, well, the gap is 5 minutes and 30 seconds. That's, that's quite amazing, the way in which the, uh, the chase is being conducted by Romiger and one or two others helping as well. That is because as fast as they go, they look at this, one off the front, then, then the next one comes through, the next one, a proper chain gun. This, this is an, abs an absolute lesson, isn't it, Russell, for anybody who is coming new into cycle racing as to how you drive a brake along. Every man's doing a turn, eh? Yeah, everyone's doing a turn here. Well, you've got to remember, you've got eight riders here doing the turns, and back in the chasing group, you've only got... Uh, three riders and if you include Neil Stevens in the pink jersey that's four riders so it's, it's, it's much diff much more difficult for four riders to go the same speed as eight riders and they haven't got a passenger at all there isn't one man missing a beat nobody's just sort of uh, going to the back and s staying there and doing nothing they're all coming through all the way lovely right on the wheels getting the maximum shoulders they come through nice slip streaming Yes, checking the stage we've had so far in the Tour de France, this being stage 17. Zilla for Anse took the first stage. Montcassin for uh, Gann took stage uh, one uh, after prologue. Then Cipollini uh, for Seiko took uh, stage two. The uh, German rider for the telecom team, Zabel, took the stage three. Sogram for Oberville Peugeot took stage four. Bleilemans for TVM took stage five. Uh, Bogart for Rabobank took stage six. Leblanc for Polti. Uh, took stage seven, the climb up to Les Arcs when all the damage started to be done in the race. And then Berzin in the time trial, and not only took the time trial, but he kept the uh, jersey, which he had from the day before, but on stage nine, the Gavis rider, having had the jersey for a couple of days, lost it to Bjorn Rees from Telecom, the Dane romping up the hill into uh, Sestra to take the jersey and the stage. So Zabel for Telecom got his uh, second uh, stage victory on stage 10. Gonzalez for the Calme team took stage 11. Pascal Richard for MG Technogym took stage 12. Solensen for Rabobank again, uh, stage 13. And uh, then Abdul Japarov on the day when the French were looking for a victory on Bastille Day with the fireworks to go with it. Uh, lost out with Abdul Japarov, steamed away on his own with about uh, two kilometres to go and got the stage then for his team, which is Refin and Padanzana, the Italian, for the career team, took stage 15 and Reese again yesterday uh, hammered his authority on the race up to Otacom. And you get some idea now, by the way, of the speed at which they're moving across this, uh, this plain here, the wheat fields. You can see that. Look at that speed. <laughs> 526. They're just not letting up. They have not missed a beat, this group. It formed on the uh, 
the climb uh, the port de la Lu at 155 kilometers when they went over the top there uh, that was where it really all started on the climb maybe about 145 kilometers I suppose, because it was an awful long climb and now they have done well over 100 kilometers and they, be, they just haven't missed a beat There's nothing really to break the riders' rhythm on their way in on this last part of the course now. Nothing that's going to scare them, I think, until we get that uh, between 4,000 and 3,000. I mean, that won't scare them, but it'll certainly go up a little bit. But whether they'll persist and then wait till they get about 1,000 metres out from the finish and start jumping around, I don't know. But right now, everybody's playing his part. I find it interesting, too, really, that um, they're still doing it here, because with, with Festina, one would have said, well, one of them might just sit on the back and rest a bit, because they've got uh, two men in the break, so why should they work to tow everybody else along? Well, the main reason is because, uh, obviously, the most important thing is Festina, Festina is to get uh, Richard Veronk, apart from winning the mountain jersey, which he's leading, is to get him up on the, uh, the rostrum in the first three places. So they want to make as much time as they possibly can on, obviously, on Alano and, uh, and Rominger, who were both excellent at the time trial. Oh, there's the Devil's Bike. We just caught a quick glance of that as that uh, group went through. So he's travelled over into Spain. I wonder how he got that through the customs. <laughs> One bike carefully owned, size for a giant. And, of course, Reese in, uh, in uh, Denmark, I think it means uh, giant. And here comes our followers. The gap then still well over five minutes back. What a disappointment in Pamplona, where the town mayor is giving a huge firework display tonight in honour of Indrain. Uh, well, their star performer having an off day again today, having an off tour de France. And have to rethink his season's programme. He is, of course, the reigning world time trial champion, Miguel Indrain, and will be going over to the Olympics. 5.20 the gap now, so despite the fact that there's some good firepower in that chasing group, you can't match the seven men here on the front. Five minutes and 20 seconds as I went through the 25 kilometre point. You can see that the marks on uh, Ooh. Ulrich's arms and, and elbows, I mean, it's so much pain, and we said earlier on, Russell having great difficulty in sleeping, but he's still ride, riding without missing a beat, isn't he? Well, he's having a fantastic tour. 541. Oh, the gap then is going to be between these riders and people like Alano and uh, uh, Scott and, and Rominger. Um, well, Scott, well, it's, it's Alano and Rominger that's going to suffer the most of all, isn't it? Because Scott, in fact, is going to be. I don't know. Well, we'll see. It's going to be Rees, Ulrich, Bronk, Jufo, Luxembourg in that order at the end of this lot. In that order, but. Uh, whew, and the thing is, every day, I mean, just look at it now, you look at Reese, and he, he doesn't seem like he's in any trouble at all. It just seems like he's on a, you know, like a Sunday ride. Yeah. He's obviously come to the Tour de France in tip-top condition. Christina Carr comes up on the left-hand side. Well, they're, they're going to be overjoyed too, aren't they? I mean, at least the Spanish have got something to, uh, uh, to be happy about with... Uh, Escartin in here for Kelmy, one of the Spanish sponsored teams. The uh, Festina being, although it's, it's uh, registered in France and rides on French Peugeot bikes, Festina is, is a Spanish team anyway. So they've got something to be cheerful about today, even if they're top men, Alano and Indrain, away at the back. The press are moving forward. You see the cars going through with the green stickers on them. Those are the press vehicles. And they're going off now down to the finish to see who's going to win this stage today into Pamplona. Stage 17 of the Tour de France uh, going into Pamplona, 262 uh, kilometres covered today and six minutes they've got on the board, so it might come down a little bit, the gap back to that chasing group containing Alano, Rominga and Miguel Indrain. At one time it had drifted a lot further back outside that, but it looks like they just, just snitched the odd second back, but I don't think they're going to catch this group at all as Ugramov goes through. 
Well, certainly, yes, he's on a different coloured bike to normal team bike. Kelmy on the standard issue, Gios, they've always been having their blue bikes with white letters on. And ahead of these riders lies the city of Pamplona that was, has been hoped when it was agree agreed that the Tour de France would come here. They'd be welcoming uh, Miguel Indrain into his uh, uh, sixth Tour de France victory, but it's not going to be. He's not even in with a shout for the victory in Pamplona. He would like, I think, to have got to this group, but not a chance. A couple of hot air balloons decorating the landscape in the distance there. And still they're working together. Good support there from the Spanish crowd. Yes, they are, aren't they? And, uh, well, they, they love cycling. It's, uh, uh, they, they, I think they get more uh, cycling on Spanish TV than uh, any other nation. It's, uh, they've got lots of their own races as well. And they, they go out and cover them, uh, Spanish TV do, and sort of almost obviously every day there's cycling on TV, but it's a, a great spectator, spectator sport in uh, Spain. And, of course, it's attracted a lot more people to it since they've had the success recently with uh, Miguel Indurain. And uh, over the years, the, the, the Kelme team uh, have been consistently riding and getting stage victories, and people like, you know, the BH team was very strong a few years ago as well. So really, the, the, the Spanish have been exposed to cycle racing for many, many years. They had great Bermonti climbers like Bermontes. They had uh, uh, Pedro Delgado winning the Tour de France as well. Uh, they don't normally have many, many good sprinters. The best sprinter they've had recently being Ke uh, the Kelme rider, Edo, because uh, they're more built for, for the mountain climbing as such. But um, there's quite a lot of small uh, Spanish teams that ride the Spanish races, and they get very excited about the whole thing. And from those smaller teams comes the riders who move up into the top echelon to ride in the, the top 20 teams in, uh, in, in Europe and therefore uh, take part in things like the Tour de France. They don't often like riding the, the single-day classics, the, 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 uh, um, the Spanish teams. You, you, oh, they, they have to ride so many of them for the World Cup, but it's not the sort of thing that uh, they, they prefer to do as far as Onsi and Bernesto are concerned. And, uh, and Kelme, they often unfortunately send the B team out to ride the, uh, the, the classics. And the gap's gone to seven minutes now. When you talk about the classics and uh, the Spanish teams going up, uh, I remember uh, early in the season when we were doing Paris Bay, that Benesto sent their team up and uh, all their bikes got stolen. They did, didn't they? Yes, yep. <laughs> so they didn't ride. I'm not quite sure <laughs> whether they arranged for them to be borrowed for the day or what. I never found out if they actually if they got the bikes back. Um, I suppose uh, we'll find the, the, the truth of that story at some time in the future. So the rider's starting to look around now to get in the last 10 k's. The difficult thing for someone to jump away is the speed is so high at the moment. When the group's going through at 33, 34 miles an hour, it's very, very difficult to jump away. So he goes through to the front again where he's been most of the day. Bjorn Reese in the yellow jersey, the Danish champion. They go back to the chasing group, doing all sorts of trouble. They're seven minutes back. Neil Stevens, the Australian on the front, followed by Tony Rominger, followed by Patrick Yonkers, another Australian, both riding for the Onse team. There's no chance of this group now actually catching the front group. Seven minutes is not possible over the last 10 Ks. This is where the winner's going to come from today. Just on the back there, shaking his legs is the Swiss rider, Lawrence Dufo. He's had an excellent sort of thing, working really well for Richard Varon. Pulling through is Bjorn Reese, just looking so smooth. It's a little, little attack here, possibly. Now, this is a PMU sprint. This is, uh, uh, it comes after 256 kilometres around. They've got 5.5 kilometres to go. Uh, to the, the finish now, so a little bit of a flurry there, just I think to see who's got the strength of their legs for the final sprint and now we're running into Pamplona for the finish proper of the stage the crowd have turned out en masse, waving their Basque flags, we're in the Basque part of the world we're uh, at the finish line, they've also got a Basque uh, speaker and a Spanish speaker and a French speaker in respect to the Basque language, which is quite unusual uh, language
language, the Basque language, and it's quite unique in the whole of the world of language, but uh, they have respected the Basque traditions by having a Basque speaker here, and the Basque love their cycling. Uh, of course, one of the hardest men of all was Marino Lajreto, who's one of the uh, commentators for Spanish TV now, who used to ride the Tour of uh, Spain, the Tour of Italy and the Tour of France when they were running that order, and he rode all three of them three years in succession. That's nine tours, and he did them all in three years. An amazing character, and he was always featuring up in the, the, the top 15 places or so, and it was, it was often thought that, oh, we usually finish between about that seventh and fifteenth or thereabouts, they've only rode one tour, and rode it with determination to get on the podium, then that might have been the uh, the position at the end uh, for him. Who are there? Inside five k's to go. Just looking at it there, Luke Blanc seems to be missing out a few turns, I'm sure. Any time now, he's got to put an attack in, because he knows he's not a super sprinter, so he's got to attack within the last two or three k's. Well, quick calculation with a seven-minute gap here. Thanks, Brian. The uh, uh, leader, Bjorn Rees, still in the yellow jersey. If this bunch comes in now, it's seven-minute gap, and it's fact 7.08, so the general classification could be at the end of this, give or take a couple of seconds or so. Ulrich will be in second spot, three minutes and 39 seconds down. Veronk moving up into third spot, four minutes and five seconds down. So Telecom would have first and second. They've got now four kilometres to go to the finish. Escartin would move uh, up there, and he would be in fourth spot, four minutes, 23 seconds down. Dufo in this uh, group here, one, two, three, four, fifth, uh, he would be at 5.52, Luttenberger sixth at 5 minutes 59, and then the rest way off the back then, Alano would be coming in after that, so we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh Alano, eighth Rominger, but they're way off the pace now, that's really put them out of contention with a podium place. Inside the final few kilometres now, this is that slight uh, rise that I told you existed on the course, and it may be a springboard for somebody to attack. The gap between 4,000 metres and 3,000 metres dragged slightly upwards, but some very good climbers here. They've all been so well, so evenly matched there on the far side. A little climber himself, Ogramov goes to him on the coat to Dibolozo. I thought it would be a chance, but has he gone far enough away? Quickly onto his wheel, looks like Dufault going across at the moment, and still just leading off the front there is a man who could search for a stage victory today, because Rod Lotto has not had one so far, but Dufo's got to him. Aldrich is on the wheel. This is the time now for someone else to attack, just as they catch Ugramov. They're all starting to look around again. It's, so Ugramov's setting the tempo. Dufo's just swinging off. Ulrich, the German, the young German, is just like setting the tempo there, possibly for beyond Reese in the yellow jersey to get the win. They've eased it down just slightly again. Everybody's looking at everyone. Remember, there's only seven riders here. Still no sign of Luke de Blanc. He's got to put an attack in before the finish, but goes to the front, Bjorn Rees. Bjorn Rees is starting to go, the yellow jersey holder. What? He's just looking around. Look at the power of that man. <laughs> it's unbelievable, isn't he? He's so strong, and he's just rocking it away. And we've got, what, uh, that three kilometres to go now in towards the finish. And Bjorn Rees has waited while the little climber has tried it on, the, on this uh, slight slope. And uh, they've all pounced on him now. He's eased back again, but he just showed them that he's the boss still. Well, thanks to that, he had a, a stage success. And rocket off here as uh, Luttenberger starts to go. Luttenberger goes away, and after him goes young Jan Olek. And down the bottom of your picture, Ugramov can't close the gap at the moment. Still, we haven't seen Luke LeBlanc. Luke LeBlanc's been sitting on the back. He's still waiting for his turn to attack. Well, he had his stage victory the other day. Perhaps he's, he's had enough of this cut and thrust at the moment, but he's certainly... And away again goes Ugramov. And Reese looks over his shoulder to see where uh, Ulrich's got to. I think he wants him to come through. Is that Ulrich in second spot or is that yeah. into third? It's a bit difficult on my monitor now to see what's happening here. But uh, Dufo and Yeah, Ulrich, Ulrich is Ulrich definitely up there. That's, that's, two. that's the reason why Bjorn Reese moved over. He didn't want to bring the rest of the pack up there. So the rest of the pack's come back up with a scarton in the green jersey, in the green shorts. Luke LeBlanc's moved up, having a nice last little drink before he throws his bottle out. They must be getting close to the finish now. Luke de Blanc's moved up. There's the big strong man, Bjorn Rees. When he went then, in that big gear, they're all in all sorts of trouble. So Ugramos on the front, followed by Ulrich, followed by Richard Varon. Varon starting to go down the left-hand side, so he can look over just over his right shoulder. This is it, they're getting close to the finish now. 
I'm interested to see that Dufo's following Reese everywhere. He's probably said, uh, they're probably doing the old one too. Let uh, Veronk have a go and then let Reese, uh, if he's going to be the strongest man, I think Dufo decided to sit on his wheel and try and follow him through. And that's just what he's done now. They're swinging around that little island. They're going to go through the 1,000 metre point. And there's a sharp left turn just about 100 metres past the 1,000 uh, metre point. And so looking over his shoulder, Dufo well, this edges around this right hander just down the road. I think that was it because uh, actually Bjorn Reese just waved his arm for Duf to Dufo to come through. Dufo came through, did a little turn. Bjorn Reese, look how strong he is. He's, he's just put his head down again. The gap's starting to open. Bjorn Reese, the Danish champion, he's in the yellow jersey. And he's gone. So what Lawrence Dufo should do now is obviously, if he can, is, is get this gap going, keep it going, and then sit on for the last sort of 300 minutes and see if he can pop him at the line. That's it then, they now come into a sharp left-hander and then they'll be able to see 800 metres down the road, straight into the finish. And there's the left-hand turn, so Bjorn Rees, the Danish champion, is in the yellow jersey at the moment, his overall leader. Starting to lead it out, Lawrence Defoe, the Swiss rider, is looking round to see, see what's happening behind. Bjorn Rees has ridden the track starts to ease it down, but just look at the gear, look at the big gear he's got, look at the power of the man. So he's left Lawrence Defoe on the front, Lawrence Defoe just moves his elbow, that indicates for Bjorn Reese to come through. Bjorn Reese starts to come through. Look how strong he looks. He's right in the middle of the road, the camera's breaking up. So, can Dufo get the stage victory for Festina, which they've been lacking so far? Reese took the stage yesterday in convincing style of Hodakam. He blasted everybody out with his super climbing ability. He did the same thing into Sestria on the shortened stage, where he left everybody groveling in his, uh, in his wake. Now Dufo has a chance. He's behind the big man's wheel, but uh, Reese will just not give up without a fight. And he's winding it up now. Still Dufo on his wheel, switching to come around on the outside then. He'll be working hard all day, Dufo has, with uh, the Veronk, but he's got the victory now on the line. He had some uh, strength left in his uh, legs for uh, the team then from uh, Spain as such to get the stage victory. And now who's going to get the third spot? Festina's got what they came here for. Looks like uh, the Kelmy rider might get third as uh, LeBlanc comes up. But no, it's going to be Ulrich who drives to the line and Ulrich's going to get third just ahead. Or did he not? Alongside Veronk, I wouldn't like to say which one got that one. But uh, Veronk and... Uh, Ulrich locked in combat, and we're going to have a long old wait now for the main group to come in. And the strength shows here on the face of uh, Bjorn Rees. He sat down there, he made his effort, and off his wheel flicked uh, Dufo, the Swiss rider, taking a victory for Festina. And uh, they're going to be very delighted with that one in Spain. And so he will. Let's see now who got uh, third. Yeah, Richard Vronk starts to lead out. He's in the polka dot jersey. He's looking under his shoulder to see if anyone's coming. He's trying to give it all he can, the biggest gear he's got possible. Really putting all his effort in. But at the last minute, Jurek, the young German, comes off his wheel and it's boom. And now uh, at the line, well, Vronk. Vronk. We go for the we go for the French being in third place. So first and third for uh, Festina. Looks like. Uh, but this is a, a happy day as far as they're concerned. We, uh, the slow motion replay again, it's just that slight dragging up here suited the lightly built uh, Dufo. And after all the work that Bjorn Reese had been doing during the day, he had to sit down. He tried his all, but he ran out of steam just at the wrong time. So stage victory goes to Dufo of Festina.